Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 11th of June 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, a grand alliance against predatory finance and beware leaking intelligence about labs. Now, we are making the transition away from community television to be completely online with YouTube and so forth. So don't forget to hit the like button so that this video circulates even more broadly. And for your own benefit, click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so that you're notified when the new videos come out. On to our first topic today, a grand alliance against predatory finance. Now, before we get into the um, nuts and bolts of that, we have a couple of updates on various topics we've been covering lately. Yeah, Lisa, just quickly. So the Australia Post issue is the intensity of the campaign um, around Christine Holgate is now coming to an end and we're moving into a big push for the Postal Bank, which is what today's show is going to be largely about. But the Christine Holgate th um, issue is still got some life left in it. So on Tuesday, the Senate will, um, uh, the Senator Sarah Hanson Young will table the report from the inquiry in the Senate. Likely on Monday, and if it's not this coming Monday, it'll be a fortnight after that, Four Corners is doing a story on the whole issue. Now, one, one of the reasons we're highlighting this is because Four Corners contacted us this week, but only after we put out a release calling them out, because we knew that they had asked people about our role in the campaign, but and those questions were premised on the attacks on us from Sarah Henderson, um, Senator Henderson and Senator Kitching, which we've discussed at length in this show. So we knew that, but they hadn't come and seen us. So we called them out and said, I point out that I, I had given Michael Brissenden, the reporter, my card. He was in the hearing room like I was when the attack happened. Um, why haven't you called me? So they did contact us this week with, these, with this ridiculous email seeking answers to three questions. When did you stop beating your wife? When did you start beating your wife? And does your wife put up with you? No, no. No bruises. No. <laughs> Does the Citizens Party or do you personally hold anti-Semitic views? Does the Citizens Party or do you personally hold racist views? Does the Citizens Party or do you personally ascribe to conspiracy theories, including that the royal family orchestrated the Port Arthur massacre? So anyway, I gave them a royal serve saying, are you kidding with these questions, right? What has any of this got to do with Australia Post? I did answer the questions, no, no, no. And people can see, I've, I've put um, the Citizens, it's on Twitter, and we'll put it, people can see it on our website, what we've done with these with these answers. But anyway, that said, so we know we're going to be featured in the show to a degree. More importantly, the show is going to be on and, and likely on Monday. So if it is, look out for that. And if it's not on Monday, Monday don't and panic. It will be, yeah. yeah, it will come up again as soon as they get to it. Um, now, uh, the other update which you covered last week on the show was Sterling First Group and the hundreds of pensioners that have been turfed out of their homes. And in this week's Australian Alert Service, we have a very crucial follow-up on some of the important material about this group and particularly one of its directors, Simon Bell, and the article traces his role in several defunct investment schemes which should have been stopped from the get-go by ASIC because the government always said this wasn't our responsibility and palmed it off to ASIC and ASIC did nothing because this is the farce, as we've talked about many times before, of fake regulation. Um, they do not exist to protect... Um, the average citizen. Now, Simon Bell, this director of Sterling, who we talk about in the article, was um, a director of West Point, which was this property development Ponzi scheme, which collapsed in 2006. Uh, he also ran Kebble, which was a company that herded investors into West Point. Kebble was then renamed Finchley, which channeled money into property developments that Bell invested in, and the federal court later ordered it to be wound up. I mean, it wasn't even lodging audited financial statements. It was a disaster. Um, Bell then set up Heritage, which was later renamed Sterling, and Heritage had been permitted by ASIC to exist despite a fake share scandal in which investors lost $15 million. So then Sterling went on to run its rent for life scheme. And go and lure all these elderly people into paying 40 years rent in advance, right, to, you know, to cover the rest of their life and then go under. Mm. And that just the fact that you can go through that series of names of companies as one director was involved in and ASIC knew him every step of the way and now he's been allowed to destroy the lives of over 100 elderly people, the government must pay. Mm. 
right? There's $18 million to be paid. The government must pay. The fact that, and here's the irony, Elisa, it's $18 million. It's nothing to the government. The people involved in this, like Denise Braley, the great woman in Western Australia who's a huge advocate for financial uh, victims, who has done the, the work on this, she points out there may be something much bigger involved here because it would be easier for the government just to pay and, and settle this case, right? This goes to the heart, though, of you cannot let... The, why do they insist on having a regulator that doesn't regulate? And what Melissa does in her article, Melissa Harrison does in the article, and people should read and call in and get a copy, we're going to put it on our website as well, is, is, is um, quote a paper by Dr. Wilson Sy, a former ASIC uh, uh researcher and APRA researcher who points out these people don't believe in, in regulation, so they actually have, the, the regulation they do have is fake. Mm. And they don't want to change that system. This is the point. So perhaps if they, if they give in to the, the Sterling First victims and pay, it would be admitting yeah. that the system's wrong and they don't want to do that. We cannot let Australia victimise these people in such a blatant way when it's clearly the authorities' fault that this scam was able to exist. Mm. And she goes through too in that article how he's even tied, tied into Timber Corp as well. So the whole edifice can come crashing down if this is actually opened up and exposed. Now we'll take a quick break and we'll come right back to get into the guts of the story about the Grand Alliance Against Predatory Finance. <laughs> Welcome back to the show where we're talking about a grand alliance against predatory finance. And of course, we just had a classic example of predatory finance. And we're now, that's the negative of it. We're now going to talk about the positive dimension um, where it's just stunning, actually. No sooner do we get onto this Australia Post campaign to revive postal banking that you begin to see all around yeah, the world yeah. signs of where the same kind of movement is taking place. And as we've reported previously on the show, in the United States, there are actually there's le legislation for some kind of public banking on the table already in 16 states. There's three pieces of federal legislation as well. Um, that includes a bill for a national infrastructure bank, which is a huge um, scheme to rebuild the country. There's also pushes to go back or to go to fully fledged postal banking in Canada, the United Kingdom, Scotland and South Africa. And as we've reviewed in the alert service in the past, there's actually um, dozens and dozens of countries that have revived postal banking in the last few decades, um, even despite the big push towards neoliberalism that's been occurring over those last few decades because they've had to keep some semblance of a functioning banking yep. system that people can access universally. Elisa, the, it, it, it comes down to this. Um, banking can be quite technical, right? And if you just have a purely private financial system and weak regulation or no regulation as we talked about, the bankers can find a million ways to steal from people, right, and loot the system. Even if they think they're doing it honestly, the end result can be looting. Whereas if you have a, pro a public presence in banking that's not there to maximise profits for itself, be profitable, yes, but not there to maximise it, but put the service first, it changes, even just that changes things to an extraordinary degree. And that's yep. what the fight has become around. And postal banks are a popular idea because the infrastructure already exists. And before you get into the details, let me just point out and what you'll hear from Elisa in a second, the amazing parallels on this whole issue mm. between the United States and Australia, what we discovered in the last eight months. Absolutely. So we've, we've just found out about this alliance called a Grand Alliance to Save Our Public Postal Service in the USA. It's existed since 2018. And it's an alliance over 80 organisations I mean, and there's a lot of endorsement from other smaller community groups and organisations. It's actually burgeoning. Um, and it started with the American Postal Workers Union who sought support from other groups to back them. So you've got city councils, unions, farmers groups, firefighters, whole host of different associations from business, education, health, law, employee groups. There's activist networks, there's community groups such as retirees groups, banking, veterans, women's groups. It's, it's a stunning array because this is something that everyone supports. Because everyone uses the post office. That's right. Um, and the, in the mission statement of this alliance, they state that politicians 
and even uh, executives within the Postal Service, and we saw the same here, have sabotaged postal operations as part of the drive towards privatisation. It states, they have slowed mail service, closed community-based post offices and mail processing facilities, slashed hours of operations, tried ceaselessly to end six-day service as well as door-to-door -door delivery and eliminated hundreds of thousands of living wage jobs. Sound familiar? Well, that's exactly the became the subtext of this whole Boston Consulting Group report, mm. the VCG report that we highlighted, that the chair of Australia Post here lied about. That report laid out the, the same agenda. Exactly Christine same. Holgate got in the way of that. Exactly. Now, on the other hand, in the United States, Trump had appointed this new postmaster, Louis DeJoy, uh, who was a large shareholder in Amazon and UPS. Members of the Congress over there or the state senates over there had accused him of creating what they called a death spiral at the Postal Service. Uh, Jim Hightower, who's one of the people who's with this grand alliance organisation, he's a political activist, author and columnist, he stated this, and I, I want you to hear this whole quote, he said, Corporate ideologues never cease blathering that government programs should be run like a business. Really? He asked. What businesses would they choose as the ethical model for governing our democracy? Pharmaceutical profiteers, big oil, Wall Street money manipulators, high-tech billionaires, airline price gougers? The good news is that the great majority of people aren't buying this corporatist blather, but instead valuing institutions that prioritise the common good. Thus, he said, by a two-to-one margin, Americans have stunned smug right-wing privatisers like DeJoy by specifically declaring in a recent poll that our US Postal Service should not be run like a business. Indeed, an overwhelming majority, including 49% of Republicans, say mail delivery should be run as a public service, even in that, if that costs more tax money. No, spot on. It's good to see Jim Hightower continue on to productive stuff since Police Academy. <laughs> um, now, he goes on to elaborate the solution that they're proposing, which includes um, postal banking. He said, we advocate expanded services such as non-profit postal banking and other financial services. And he talked about the existing network of some 31,000 post offices that are perfectly suited for banking for the one in four Americans with no bank account that are ignored by the big uh, banking chains. Uh, and he said, our post offices served as banks for millions of us until 1967 when Wall Street profiteers got their enablers in Congress to kill the competition. Um, now, we want to show a video uh, of um, this is from the website of this organisation. It's their promotional video. So have a look at this. I'm Danny Glover, and I believe the Postal Service is one of our most vital institutions. I'm the son of postal workers. My mom and dad worked for the Postal Service for most of their working lives. My sister was a postal clerk my brother a letter carrier. I even worked at the post office during Christmas breaks as a teenager. Working for the Postal Service enabled my parents to buy their first home. They took great pride in their work, connecting customers, families, businesses, uniting our country. Now more than ever, we need the Postal Service to thrive and innovate for the future. The Postal Service belongs to all of us. It reaches everyone, everywhere, delivering medicine, packages, letters, newspapers, and catalogs without a dime of taxpayers' money. It never stops. But some people want to bury the Postal Service, shut offices, reduce hours, limit delivery, outsource it, divide it, and privatize it. The Post Office is an anchor, a symbol of community. The Postal Service bridges racial, political, geographic, and economic divides. It is one of the nation's largest employers of veterans, women, and minorities, providing equal pay for equal work. Good, decent union jobs. Let's salute the 625,000 postal workers. They stamp their mark of excellence on the Postal Service of yesterday, today, forever. Join me in a grand alliance to strengthen a cherished institution, our postal service, a public trust, a national treasure. 
Now, Lisa, not to be corny, but let me just say this. This idea is a lethal weapon <laughs> against predatory finance. This is why we called the segment of this title this. This is a very positive idea, but understand what we're talking about. Mm. There's a, there's a purely privatised, deregulated, lawless, wild west financial system, especially in the Western world, and it has gouged us to death. And we're, 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 um, we, we, all of us countries though have a history like it, like the Jim Hightower referenced before 1967, they had postal banking. We had the Commonwealth Bank, where at least when there's a public presence there that the privates have to compete with, there's a modicum, a, a certain standard of honesty that has mm. to be applied, right? And that's what we, we this, this is a very potent idea to take that vested interest of private financial um, profiteers um, on. Yeah, and there's, there's actually, the, the push is really building even from a lot of other angles. I mean, I'll put up this headline now. US banks look like they'll be cutting a couple of hundred thousand jobs in the coming period. So, you know, there's an urgency. Yeah. So, for instance, you've got the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts that's now pushing lawmakers to start a public bank. You have the San Francisco City Government that's established a committee to look at creating a public bank. And the LA City Council has unanimously passed a resolution to support the California Public Banking Option Act currently pending in the State Assembly. And this in California is because they passed a bill in 2019 creating a legal framework for public banking. So what we're doing here is we have a bill, the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank Bill, right? It's right as we speak at the drafting office of the federal parliament. Now there's a hiccup that I've referenced before, we won't go through that now, but we have to overcome that hiccup to get that bill introduced in parliament. We know there's cross-party support for the idea, we have to get the bill introduced. We will be releasing in coming days a draft resolution that we're asking people, viewers of this show, to get copies of this and wherever you live, take it to your local institutions, especially your local councils, mm -hmm. chambers of commerce, people, institutions that would appreciate the importance of the postal network and the need for banking services and get them to pass this resolution through the council and then at the, from the local council go to the state um, local government association, then from the state one, go to the, the, the national local government association, this kind of process to build a groundswell of support at the grassroots for this idea, mm. right? There's a, there's a, um, there's a, there's a, a, a new online news service called The Regional where the journalist Dale Webster has gone to great lengths to document the, the shutdown of regional banking services in Australia. This solves all of that. It keeps the post offices viable, such as what this Grand Alliance is fighting for. And it takes, it will be something that the reason the, the private banks, the big four will hate it, because it will break their monopoly and that would be such a damn good thing for Australia. Yep. So this is a great idea. Um, watch out for that resolution and get involved in that part of the campaign where you confront your local councils and say, pass this resolution. And you, a lot of people will, a lot of institutions will. Mm. So look out for that. Now we'll be right back after this break to discuss intelligence leaks. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing beware leaking intelligence about labs. So we, this topic is concerning the fact that um, amidst some discussion in mainstream media, there's now also been a number of um, reputable science journals and so forth that have revived this idea that COVID-19 emerged from a lab from the Wuhan uh, laboratory in China. Wuhan Institute of Virology. Now, let me just say first, it's 100% natural to wonder, to suspect if it did. Of course it's natural. To, and guess what? People did at the time, including the people who worked at that lab, right? That part's normal. But there's a difference. And I, this is the only thing, reason we wanted to do this, this segment today, because we can't prove, it one, prove anything one way or the other. But understand the difference between evidence and proof and the current pile-on we're seeing, which is political. What we're seeing now is political because... There is nothing new in the evidence than what was looked at um, a year ago, in, including in all the Fauci emails, etc. There's lots of, if you see a headline on Fox News or Sky News or whatever, they'll, they'll lead you to believe something else, but it's actually, there's nothing new in any of that, right? Um, and, and we have to be emphatic on this, Elisa, because we should have learned from the weapons of mass destruction fiasco what intelligence actually is. It's not 
truth. Piecemeal intelligence doesn't cut it when you, when you want to make accusations against another country. We need to demand proof because the consequences are can be terrible, as happened then. And in this case, as we've been warning about, there's a drumbeat for war with China and that will be the end of the world, mm. right? So let's be really, really sure that what we're being fed on these things is sound. Um, so I want, just want to talk about, look, there's an article in this week's alert by Richard Barden um, dealing with this. And it's part of it. It's a follow-up from what he did last week. I invite people to um, get a copy, right, and read it for themselves. Richard is very experienced in taking on, he's not, not, not the science claims, the intelligence claims about the science. And he hasn't just done it in this area. We, we assigned Richard the job of writing about chemical weapons attacks in Syria, about the claims in Libya, about Ukraine and the MH17 uh, incident, about the Russiagate hoax, about the Scripples poisoning and the, the various claims about China. And Richard does a very good job at assessing the intelligence and, and poking holes in it because often the intelligence is either outright disinformation or based on leaps of logic, right? Um, so this is really worth reading. It gets quite a bit technical, but let me just give you some specifics in relation to this. First of all, when it comes to this claim, I want people to have in their mind what constitutes proof about this claim, that the virus came from a lab, the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. You have to answer the question and prove that the virus, that this virus was in that lab. Anything, anything, all the other discussion is irrelevant. Can they prove that this virus was in that lab? Because if they can, then there's a story. If they can't, there's nothing. It's all sound and fury signifying nothing, and that's what we've got so far, right? So what might be the case? Well, there's an Australian who was part of the World Health Organization delegations, Professor Dominic Dwyer. He's the head of um, pathology, director of pathology in New uh, South Wales. New South Wales. Um, he's taken on some of the claims that in the article that kicked off this latest round of suspicion, which was in the Bulletin of, Economic, uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, it was regarded as an objective article by this, by this New York Times science writer, Nicholas Wade. And everyone said, oh, they've done an objective job on this. Maybe there is something there. He pointed out, no, there's some really wild claims in that. And I just one he pointed out um, is this. Uh, the Nicholas Wade claimed in that article that the original SARS back in 2004, it only took four months to find the animal host for that virus, Right. And therefore, he's saying, because we haven't found, because they say that this COVID-19 comes from an animal, but they haven't found the animal host yet, mm. well, that's a bit sus. Dominic Dwyer pointed out, that's rubbish. It took 14 years to find that host. The Hendra virus, which, which came from flying foxes in Australia. We've had, we've had viruses jump into humans from, from animals here too, people. Mm. It's, not, it's not just bat eaters. The Hendra virus in Queensland, it took two years and that was a much easier thing to try and ascertain. And it still took two years to find it. We're not two years into this pandemic yet, right? So, um, uh, you know, it, it, and one of the reasons it's more complicated now is because um, you've got, you don't just have the story around Wuhan and this wet market and all that, but you've, got, you've now got evidence that the Italian scientists found mm. COVID-19 antibodies in blood samples from September 2019, right? It's a very complicated picture. So that's... A lot of this stuff is a lot of the actual discussion you're hearing is noise. As Dwyer said, what I said at the beginning, it's got to, you've got to actually ascertain that this virus was in that lab, and that's what we don't have any evidence for yet. And one of the reasons to assume it's not is because this lab produces a lot, a lot of papers about what's in that lab, and they never wrote any paper about this virus. And if you say that's because it's a secret because they're hiding it, Rubbish, it's not very much of a bioweapon if, if that's why they would do that. Yep. So the jury's out. Now we've run out of time, so make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and join us next week for further information. Thanks for tuning in.